Hi, we continue our exposition of intervals by now looking at fourths and fifths. So we'll start with the fourths. With fourths there are two types of quality. There's a perfect fourth and an augmented fourth. Now you'll recall from the last video that a major third made up a span of uh, four frets. The next interval of a certain quality on the list is the perfect fourth. So it stands that we now have a five fret span. It's easier to look at fourths across adjacent strings because of this, though one should keep in mind how many frets there are in between. But due to the tuning of the guitar, let's start with the bottom E string and just pick any note, say B. The perfect fourth is the next string above on the same fret. The same thing applies for the fifth string and the fourth string. Same for the, uh, the fourth and the third. So let's just say I take a B. Again, they're both on the same fret separated by a string. Now when the fourth is on the B string, it follows that the, that the root is on the first and that we're up the string as well as a fret because of the tuning. And then once again, once we get to the top two strings, we simply have the same fret and that gives us our perfect fourths. Okay, so let's say we start again at the bottom string and we'll, we'll just play C for example and we're playing a C perfect fourth. What happens when we sharpen that fourth to move up a fret? You can hear that's quite tense. That's the augmented fourth. So that is the next next type and quality of interval in the sequence of intervals that, we, that we're studying. Now the remarkable property about these is they, they split an octave into two equal parts. In other words, there's six frets between a root and its augmented fourth. This has many powerful properties which we'll examine in subsequent lectures, but it's worth pointing out at this stage that it does in fact divide an octave of 12 notes into uh, into two exact halves. Okay, so the same rule applies. If we take adjacent strings fourth and fifth, then let's just say we start at D, its augmented fourth interval will be on the sixth fret, so a fret above a string above. Same with the fourth and third strings. Once again, once now that we get to the augmented fourth being in the upper register or on the B string and the root on the third then we have a two fret span. You can really hear the quality of that interval and it really demands some sort of resolution and it's really powerful just to sit on it. Once again when we get to the top two strings there's just one string and a fret difference. So they're the fourths. We can similarly look at fifths. Now there's two type qualities of fifths that we'll look at. One is the diminished fifth and one is the perfect fifth. Now as it turns out we already know what the diminished fifth intervals look like because they're enharmonically equivalent to augmented fourths. In other words, in terms of shape, as it were, they are exactly the same. So that just leaves us with perfect fifths. Given that we took an augmented fourth to be a string and a fret difference, a perfect fifth will be a further fret up on the, on the upper string and you can hear that resolution. Okay, so this is where the so-called power chords come from. We've got a first and we've got a fifth and this is where triads come from also. They're made up of, of, a, of a first, some type and quality, well sorry, some quality of a third and some quality of a fifth. Now, because we're just looking at the two notes, the root and the perfect fifth in this case, it follows that there is no third to speak of in such a structure, and therefore the chords are neither major nor minor. This creates many melodic possibilities when soloing over the top of these types of chords, because the third isn't necessarily always implied. So that gives us some sort of indication of the fifth. So they're pretty easy to play. Um, like I say, they're like power chords, and all the way along, they're just 
the root note, then the, the next string up, two frets down, with the exception of the B string again, when the fifth is on the B string, it's a three fret dis distance. Now we can also look at perfect fifths another way, and that is to put a uh, string in between the upper and lower, between the first and the perfect fifth. This just follows yet again because of the tuning of the guitar. So what, what exactly am I talking about? Basically, let's take G for example. On the third fret of the bottom string and D it's, it's perfect fifth on the fifth string at the fifth fret. Well, if we replace the fifth string with the fourth string, we can play that open because of the tuning of the guitar. So in other words, what we've got is the root, move up two strings and back three frets. It's very useful to look at chords in this particular way because of the fact that what this means is that we can in fact drop some quality of third into the, the idle string in between the two notes. Okay, so to continue, if we take the fifth string and the third string, again we've got that three fret span, and then if we were to take the fourth string, we've got a two fret span because of the tuning of the B string. Similarly, if we were to take the third string, we've got a two fret span yet again. And it turns out that after that there is no other possibilities for playing fifths in this, in this manner because we basically run out of strings. Okay, so have a fiddle with those. And as an exercise, I'd like you to do the following thing. Go back to the third intervals that we discussed and the types of chords that whether they are major or minor in the key of C. Now add the fifths, figure out what the fifth is for each chord. Now if you've got a first, a major third and a perfect fifth, you've got a major chord. If you've got a first, a minor third and a perfect fifth, you've got a minor chord. If you've got a first, a minor third and a diminished fifth, then you've got a diminished chord. So have a go at that and see how you go. I'll continue with sixth and sevenths in the next video. See you then.